you know, one of the things we, we often cover at the Center for Humane Technology is people radically underestimate both how transformative to the good and to the bad a technology is. And they come with simple narratives about what this is going to do. And then we're surprised five or 10 years later when the technology was so much more complex than we thought, that we drove the car into you know this or the other ditch by the side of the road, that we, we didn't stop to imagine what this would do to our world. And I guess what I'm trying to ask you is like, if we look at the next few years, what are the transformations that are going to be surprising to our labor market that you too will understand, but that people won't have thought about? Uh, on my end, I would say, I think that people are underestimating the level of quality of work that these systems can produce. And I'm, I'm partially at fault. Like when I wrote Co-Intelligence, intern was the right analogy to use for AI. It is not working at intern level anymore. And I think that one of the things that will blindside people a bit is how capable these systems are. I, I am now getting fully automated papers out of these systems that I would be impressed by a second year graduate student producing. Right? We're not you're, you're there yet and replacing me as a professor, but like if you had told me I can get a high quality academic paper, or if I throw something in GPT-5 Pro, it finds errors in my papers that that ten seminars and you know and uh, the review process and a thousand citations since have never located before. Like the changes are to high level, high intellectual level work. I think people are not expecting as much as they are, and then I think the big bet, the possibility, one way or the other, is. Agents just in the last four months, for a variety of really interesting reasons, have just started to work. Um, and the question is, are they going to get as good as people think? Because then it becomes very different when I can just say to the AI, hey, go through my you know, email, figure out what my priorities are, um, email our top sales prospects that I haven't had attention to, go back and forth with them, build the products they need to customize it in the proposals, and just take care of stuff. Like That is what the labs are aiming for. And if we're there, that's a very different change than I turn to the AI and ask it to write the proposal. It's not a good proposal. I ask it to change the proposal again. And then I check my email because the AI can't check my email. And then it misses some of the context of who the person is. I think that people are not expecting models to get as good as I think they're already getting. But all that leads me back to the question, which is I, I think I'm afraid that this notion of a gradual labor transition that we're going to wake up one day and say it's a 10% and there is a 20%, it's a 30%. It's not how this is going to be. Like we're going to wake up one day to realize that the connective tissue between doing these different tasks that make up our jobs, suddenly uh, an AI can do it and suddenly an entire function is, is automated. Aren't we likely to see these big punctuated changes in, you know, radiologists are safe right now because they're overseeing the AI and all of a sudden you wake up next month. And you know what, we don't need radiologists anymore. If the agent stuff works the way the AI labs want, and there's lots of ifs in that statement, right, that we could talk about. If it does, then yes, it will be slowly and then all at once. Because the problem with substitution is everything we're talking about with the process, right? Like, how, you know, if the system isn't very good, if you have to do a lot of work building custom solutions, if you have to ask mid-career people to replace themselves with AI, you're going to have all sorts of forms of resistance. But if I can just go ask an AI agent, do this task, figure it out, then we have a very sudden change. And that is what the world that people are aiming for is, right? And so again, you know, we don't know. And Molly, how does that affect your work? Like, what do you think? I think this notion of a drop-in remote worker vis-a-vis -vis an AI agent is what is driving fear in people. Because that is unbelievably disruptive. If the AI labs can truly create an agent that is literally just drop in, you now are, are like covering certain functions and you're basically my virtual teammates, that vision is extremely disruptive. I personally, I think we are overestimating how quickly that's going to come and how many bottlenecks there are that are very sort of interpersonal systems. I mean, most of our jobs don't look just like coding. And I think there's a reason why coding is out in front. The real world is far messier. When I sit in Washington, D.C., I often work out of La Pan Cotidian in Capitol Hill, and I'm surrounded by lobbyists and people whose whole world is relationships and influence. And when I go to Silicon Valley, they live in a world of coding where, you know, it's just a very, there's many aspects of our job that I think are not going to be so easy to to replace with a drop-in remote worker. So I, I don't have the same AI 2027 fear that we're, we're staring down in a year from now. But I agree with Ethan that typically I expect this to be more gradual than the, what you're hearing from Silicon Valley. But there could be pretty dramatic 
punctuations. If agents get really good, I think it will start moving a lot faster. You know, the other thing I would say is I totally agree with Ethan and you, Daniel, that I think the public in many ways is underestimating how good these models are getting at certain very skilled, highly cognitive tasks. You know, when ChatGPT Deep Research came out, that is my job. So I, I had that 100%. experience of this moment, what Ethan talked about in his book. I felt it. I mean, I, my hair is standing up on my arms right now because I had that out-of-body experience where I got access to it. I asked it to write a paper. I have wanted a famous economist to write for years, which is what can we learn positively from the last few decades of technology automation and women? Because women have been a lot more resilient than men. So I gave a bunch of really high quality papers and some people, they should, the paper that ChatGPT put out was so well done. I've shared it with lots of extremely influential economists as my example of how good this is. And this is going to creep up in so many different, very expert, high quality knowledge jobs. And that for society is dramatic change. Just a few years ago, if I had been on this podcast before ChatGPT's launch, which was three years ago this month, I never would have identified these highly skilled, highly cognitive roles as being susceptible. So still think in the real world there it's going to be slower, like to your point about radiologists. I actually think it's going to move slower to fully replace humans in some of these roles. But I think businesses are sectors are going to be disrupted, roles are going to be disrupted, it's going to be uneven, but it will happen. And I think what instills fear in the heads of so many Americans is this sense of Russian roulette. Are you going to be the person that's going to wake up one day and there's a version of ChatGPT deep research that can do your job? And I think that's terrifying to people to sense this is these are careers people have spent a lot of money, a lot of time on their education, years of experience. And I think people feel quite vulnerable. Um, but again, the, the sort of caveat to that is I don't think we are facing down in two years PhD level drop in remote workers that are going to substitute for most of us. But I have three kids. So I, my eldest is 10. So when I look out, I think 10 years from now is still when he's in college. Like right. this is still in the lifetime of a lot of us, especially those of us with kids. Like this, this, where this could go could be mind boggling. But I think we should feel some comfort that tomorrow our, our organizations are not going to be full of drop in remote workers. And I, I agree. I mean, I think that there's, a, uh, but I, I feel like what ends up happening sometimes in these discussions, and I think Molly, we're on the very same page about this, and Daniel as well, which is that there is this sort of view of like, it's either all hype or it's 2027 and there'll be right. super intelligent machines and we're all just going to be building machine pyramids or something like that for them. And I think that there's a tendency to, to swing to one side or the other, and especially exactly. for people who are kind of rational people who study this field like, like us to be, you know, oh, the hype is overblown. I, I, the hype is off, like in almost certainly, but it's not off by as much as people who like, that doesn't mean things look normal in the near future. Right. Well, it's like the hype is overblown, but the skepticism is overblown too. Right. And, and the timeline is there. Like people, there is enough value now in the models that people will figure out a way. Like, let's say there's a financial collapse of AI stuff. I'm not convinced that there's a bubble, but there could be a bubble. I don't know. I have any idea. I don't think that matters very much from, I think a lot right. of people think that something is going to make this all go away, that we're going to hit some limit and then AI is done for and we're going to work like, so it's either you can ignore it or you have to panic all the time. And I think we are in the world's um, either best or worst place, which is you have agency right now. Like this is the time for policy intervention. This is the time okay. for companies to show models of good use. But it is not a time where it's like either are, we're all doomed or you know, we're all saved, right? I love that statement so much. And actually, that was partly the motivation of the research paper I put out with Yale was not to say there's nothing to see here. I, I am very firmly believing that this technology has enormous capability, but it was to say, look, we have a moment to catch our breath and shape the way this is going to play out. I don't like the fear mongering coming from Silicon Valley in a way that strips us of our agency. This thing is coming tomorrow. There's nothing we can do to stop it. It's this inevitable force. You know, every job loss is all about AI. This is coming for you. Don't even go to college. I mean, this is sometimes the tenor of the conversation. Part of what we wanted to do with ground the conversation to say today, we are not yet in a jobs apocalypse is not to say it will never come. It's to say, let society catch our breath and let us steer this. Let us have agency because this is not going away and every day it's getting better.